And so I wanted to talk about how game design creates community and builds intelligence because um, games as a field have been a really fascinating development over the last about 30 years. And uh, there's one particular branch of that development that I think is interesting to this topic that I want to focus on in particular. Um, so I should give a little background on myself just to prove that I should be standing up here. Um, I've been a game designer for about 10 years. I've designed in several spaces. This is a game that I designed called Diner Dash. Um, I swear this will be the only self-aggrandizing thing I say in this entire talk. Um, this game was downloaded a half a billion times, um, which is sort of an interesting number to think about. This is a game called IED The Cost of Life I worked on, which is considered a serious game in the sense that it speaks to serious topics. Um, this was a game about Haiti and education and showing the difficulties that education suffer, suffers in places of impoverishment. So the idea was to teach people by raising a family um, of, uh, of Haitians and trying to get them educated, the difficulties that you face in educational systems that aren't uh, Western ones. Um, and this is a festival that I co-founded with Greg Treffry and Catherine Herdlick called Come Out and Play. It was the world's first sort of public games festival. And we're in our eighth year, and we have branches in New York, LA, Amsterdam, and we have offshoot groups like Hide and Seek and Go Play and Steel Games in cities like Pittsburgh, Berlin. There's going to be in Athens very soon. So we've, we've really kind of internationalized um, public play and play in, in, in the streets. Um, but I, I don't want to talk about any of that. Um, I want to talk about protein folding. Um, so so uh, protein folding is a, is a sort of really fascinating field because it, it speaks to, to a lot of medicine in a really deep way. And I don't actually know a ton about protein folding, except that I know that it's, it's hideously complex. It, it basically, um, there's a physical process by which these, these, these protein structures will fold, and the shapes that they take, if they're correctly folded, will lead to certain kinds of enzymes, certain kinds of, of, uh, of medical uses that make them very powerful. But if they're folded incorrectly, they become toxic. And a lot of thinking about um, sort of drug treatments and drug development is around thinking about how proteins can be folded. But the problem is there's like like just to, to speak to some of the stuff that Vi was talking about yesterday, there's just billions and billions of possibilities of the way these things could be folded. Um, and what, we, what they found is that they tried to develop this and they tried to, as, as scientists, tried to figure out effective ways to fold proteins that the numbers were so high that even computers had a hard time crunching all of them at the stage of computing technology we're at now. So they decided to try an experiment and the experiment was something called fold it. And what Fold it was, was a, what Fold it is, and you can still do it now if you want, is a website where you can go up and fold proteins. You can log in, and then they basically allow you to, through an interface that looks like this, um, fold proteins into what are effective shapes. And they basically just unleashed this on the internet, and they said, okay, help us make science, right? Like, help scientists make science. Gamers of the world solve these puzzles. And you can see that um, the elements of this board are actually quite specifically game elements, right? So there's a progress marker and a level structure and there's a, there's a game tool interface. And so it, it's, a, it's a game, right? It's a game where you solve puzzles and there's a high score list on the front page and it, it basically, uh, you know, it allows gamers to play a game that supposedly helps with proteins. So how did they do? Um, well, in about three weeks, Gamers playing Fold It help map out a structure of an enzyme that could be used to help HIV and AIDS. Um, now, what I think what fascinates me about this is actually, the, and the headline doesn't even cover it, so I think they bury the lead, is it's a three-week period. So in three weeks, a series of totally distributed gamers just hitting this thing, trying to play it, with no knowledge of what protein folding is, no knowledge of medicine, no knowledge of the use, just trying to get points by folding a weird-looking organic structure, uh, managed to create uh, a structure of an enzyme that could help cure one of the most horrendous diseases facing the world today. Um, that's fascinating, right? And when this happened, people took notice of it. Um, and it became like this sort of cause celeb for like moving games into other structures. So the question is, what is how did this work? Like what, what happened here that this was possibly effective and how can this get utilized in the future? And to understand that, we need to think about games in general. Now, I, I do say games in general, because to game designers like myself, games are games no matter where they, they surface. So, um, you know, first person shooters are not really that different than board games, are not really that different than puzzle games, are not really that different than card games, are not really that different than sports. Games are games. They obviously are different in form. The way you make this is very different than the way you make this, like physically make it. And clearly the play patterns in this are not the same as the play patterns in this. 
But the basic ideas are the same. The basic technique is the same, right? Just like painting can, can spread across like wild varieties of styles with wild varieties of medium, with wild varieties of, of materials and even extending beyond the simple like two dimensional canvas, we still recognize that it's painting because you do the same basic things. Similarly with game design we do the same basic things. So what, what are the basic things that make up a game? Well, first of all, we, every game has a goal. This, by the way, is gonna sound very unfun. What I'm about to describe is gonna sound absolutely nothing like a game to you, but take my word for it, we're gonna get back there. Um, every game has an objective, right? And the objective is presented to the player at the beginning of the experience, right? So, so if you just think about a game like, like, like football, non-American football, um, the goal in non-American football, in soccer, as we call it, is to get the ball into, the, into your goal, which is on the opposing side of the field. Right, so the objective of the game is to do that as many times as possible, and thus have a higher score, which you get by getting the ball into the goal, than your opponent, right? That's, that's the first sort of piece of any game. And any game you ever look at will have this kind of goal structure. The goal structure may be absolutely deterministic, meaning that when you succeed at the goal, the game ends. It may be a competitive goal, where it's, it's just comparative to someone else, or it may be a set of short-term goals that don't ever really end. So it might be that like I just give you a level to reach and then another level to reach and then another level to reach. But that structure of, of something to accomplish is present in every game system that, that exists. The second thing that you see in every game system is a set of rules, right? And the rules are effectively limitations that determine how you pursue the goal. So the rule in soccer, or the core rule in soccer, is that you cannot handle the ball with your hands unless you are the goalie in a very specific box, right? Um, in, and, and obviously games get complicated in terms of rules and that like rules can get really extensive and really detailed. Um, and digital games have rules too, they're called code, right? Because the code lets me do things, <coughs> excuse me, the code lets me do things and then doesn't let me do things. And so the rules determine the methodology by which I pursue the goal. And that's basically it, that's, that's what a game is. Doesn't sound fun at all. Um, what this does is it creates a series of incentives. Because the rules will determine certain ways I can work and certain ways I can't work. And those things will then lead me to choose to do certain behaviors or not do other behaviors because of their efficacy to get me towards the goal. And so my whole decision making ha that happens in a game, when I make choices in a game, I'm making those choices because the rules say that to get to the goal I have to do certain things and I can't do other things. And by implication, certain things are better and certain things are worse. So let me give you an example to actually make this make sense. Golf. Uh, Brian Sutton Smith, in a book called The Study of Games, uses golf extensively to explain how games work. Okay. What's the goal in golf? Get the ball in the hole, right? So if you think about it, uh, if we imagine the hole was at the end of this stage and, and I was the golfer, if I wanted to get the ball in the hole in the most effective way possible, right, I would <laughs> do that, right? Especially considering the fact that the ball is this big and the hole is like that big, right? But that's not what we do when we play golf, right? Instead, what we do when we play golf is we stand hundreds of yards away from the ball and we take a metal stick and we swing the metal stick at the ball trying to knock the ball into the hole without touching it in any way. If you think about that for a second, this is one of the craziest ways to get a ball in a hole possible. <laughs> right? It, it, it's really next to impossible when you think about it. And the first time you play golf, I mean, what, what's your par the first time you play golf? Like 25? <laughs> like, like 30? Like you just you slice the ball in all sorts of crazy directions and then you sort of like sit, stand there with the putter like frustratedly trying to knock it into the little hole. Right? Um, but golf is one of the most popular things on television in terms of sports watching. It, it constantly raises tons of money from sponsorships. It's played by hundreds of thousands of people across the world. So that crazy way of getting a ball into a hole is actually really effective. And it, it becomes something that we call fun, right? So that, that relationship between the goal, get the ball in the hole, and the rules, you can only hit the ball with a metal stick, um, create an experience that's fun. And this is something that was identified in positive psychology um, by Shikset Mahaili uh, in a book called Flow, although he wasn't talking about games, he, he game designers latched onto this immediately is that um, in human beings we see that happiness results from a certain kind of engagement. I mean happiness, not pleasure, like, like intense happiness. Um, and it comes when we see that the skills that an activity demands us to use 
are matched by the challenge that the, the activity demands. So that what happens is, if, a, if we're faced with something that demands all of our attention and we succeed at it, or we succeed at it after a little bit of struggle, we end up in this thing that uh, Shikset Mahaili calls flow, and which game designers call fun. So that idea of challenge, that challenge, that ch good challenges that we succeed at, we enjoy, is the sort of fundamental principle of how games work. I want to warn you, though, that challenge is a very fuzzy term, because a challenge might be an easy challenge, it might be a fairly simple challenge, it might be a fairly quick challenge, or it might be a very deep, dedicated, hard challenge. The level of challenge depends on the audience, but for every audience, in every case, it's the struggle against the system or an opponent that challenges us that makes us enjoy ourselves. That's fun. And just think about ever playing golf if you like golf, or any other sport if you want proof of that. But the, the sport is the most fun when you're working. Um, and that, this gets used in a whole bunch of different ways. So this is Modern Warfare 2, which is sort of like, like the kind of staple entertainment game. Uh, this game made a billion dollars. It made seven million dollars in the day it launched. Um, it's probably the single most popular hardcore game that there is, and it makes incredible amounts of money. Um, so like games are a major form of entertainment. Uh, games are used to make political messages. This is a game called Phone Story, made by Mole Industria, um, and it's an iPhone game that shows you how uh, rare earth metals are, are mined to make your iPhone. So it's a, it's a political message about how, how, you're, how, how you got your iPhone in the first place, and you can see from some of the imagery that, that maybe that wasn't so cool. Um, there are games about education. This was a game made by USC called Application Crunch, and then you can't really see the cards because they were fuzzy in the images I found, but they basically, show, they, they basically teach people how to apply to, to college by giving them like, different kinds of actions they can do, like classes or odd jobs or volunteering, and adding them up to build an application. Um, and there are games that are attempting to make art. This is a game called Shadow of the Colossus, which is generally recognized in gamer circles as like the high bar of art. It's a, it's a game tragedy in which you play a tragic hero, um, like doomed to failure because of your own mistakes, in which you fight giant monsters. Um, it's a really beautiful game. I, I, I could give a whole talk just about this game alone. Um, but what I really want to focus on today is, is none of those things. And I want to focus on another aspect of games, which is the way games build community. And I want to start by talking about this from the perspective of a game I worked on with Frank Lance and Katie Salem called The Big Urban Game. So this is a real world game, and that's a giant balloon, and that's a person, just to give you a sense of scale. That's me behind the giant inflatable dice. Um, we ran this game in Minneapolis, St. Paul in, uh, I think, 2003. Um, it was from the Design Institute of, uh, in the University of Minnesota. They were interested in, in showing design on a city scale. And so we, we proposed this crazy thing. Uh, this is Frank Lance in shadow in front of us. Um, you can see this map in the background. That's why I took this image. The idea was that there were three pieces. And uh, each day, the city would, would uh, organize itself into teams. And they would vote on one of two routes the piece could take. So the yellow piece could go this way, or it could go that way to get to its, to its destination for that day. And the race took place over five days. Um, and what would happen is once the route was decided at 5.30 every day, a small team of people who had been pre-selected, about 10 people, would go and pick up the piece and then carry it through the street. And it had to obey traffic laws. <clears throat> and then when they got to the destination, we would record their time, and that was their time in the race. And we would add up the time for all the days, and that would be their final result. Now, the reason why I bring this game up, um, this is what it looked like when people carried the piece. Um, the reason why I bring this up is because when we made this game, no one had ever done this before. Um, and uh, we got to use the balloon like twice before it, before it went out there, so we carried it around a little bit. But the teams had seen the balloon one, like literally one time. There was a, a, a little workshop that took place over like a half an hour at the university campus where the team came and they got to pick up the balloon, it got inflated, and they got to carry it around. And that's it. And then they ran the race for five days, and they would run probably for something like 40 minutes a day. Now, what fascinated me about this game, well, a lot fascinated me about this game, but the relevant thing for this conversation um, is that I ran with one of the teams on the final day because I wanted to see what it was like to actually carry the piece. So I just went with them, and I ran with them. And by the fifth day, they had worked out a system where one person would stand in front of the group, like that referee person, right? And everybody else would be carrying the balloon. And some of them would be on guide ropes, and some of them would be in the back. And they'd all be jogging. And I want, to, I want to point out that no one ever stopped jogging in anything I'm about to describe. The piece, as you can see, is kind of taller than power lines and taller than traffic lines. So you have to lay it down 
when you get to those things. And what would happen is, if the referee running up front saw a power line, he would blow on his whistle once. When he blew on his whistle, all the players in the back would let go of the balloon and start running backwards as the people on the rope started pulling the balloon down, as the people on the front started pushing the balloon up, until the balloon became horizontal, at which point the people in the back would catch the head of the balloon and they would carry it under the power line, until such time as the referee blew the whistle twice, at which point the people in the back would jump and throw the balloon up while the people in the rope started pulling the balloon and the people in the front started pulling the balloon down in time so that the people in the back could catch the balloon when it became upright and continue jogging without stop. And I want to remind you that these people had this balloon for maybe four and a half hours in total in their whole life, and none of these people had ever manipulated a balloon before. So what does that incentive structure do? Well, that incentive structure allows us to coordinate, and it taps into our collective intelligence. Because when we're faced with a problem that we're interested in solving, and that we enjoy solving, we immediately start to amplify our groupthink and work as a team more effectively. And that can become very, very powerful. Um, and this isn't just used in those kind of activities. Like we see the most, like probably the most profound example of this kind of team building that games create in, in American football, right? I, I just love these kind of people. Like how many activities in the world elicit this kind of reaction? Um, first of all, American football has just enormous complexity in its gameplay. Like just really like a crazy amount of complexity in its gameplay. And if you watch a play in American football, just like a basic pass, you should just marvel at the coordination of that many people to do something that is just about impossible, right? Which is throw a ball 40 yards under pressure and have someone catch it without any, any direct communication between them at all. But similarly, it's not just a community that's created in the field and the sort of, the sort of sophistication of this community. It's also that fandom creates community as well, right? That the, that the interactions of teams and competition um, bring people together. And I actually totally disagree with, with sort of um, like, 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 like utopian globalist belief systems because I believe that humans are tribal and that things that tap into our tribal nature make us more like powerful and that could be used very effectively as long as we don't try killing each other. That competition is actually a really good thing because it drives people to be more successful. Um, and, th and this kind of activity is great for building sort of city pride and, and wonderful city rivalries, um, which I will just leave you to imagine from wherever, whatever municipality you're from. Um, and of course, digital games utilize this too. Um, this is a, uh, a raid in uh, World of Warcraft, and there's like f about five people that you can see on screen. There's a couple more off screen, and you can see this like enormously complex interface here. And all of this is used to manage the interaction of five real people coordinating at the same time to accomplish a goal. And there are machines at this. Like they just do this over and over and over again to kind of build a sophisticated leadership structure. And a lot of people have argued, there, there, there are VCs that have publicly argued that they look to people who had World of Warcraft experience for management experience because they've learned to coordinate large teams of people in complex tasks. Um, but that's not just for hardcore gamers. We also have this sort of friend networks that are built up in casual games. This is a game called Cityville by Zynga. Um, you know, that, that sort of asks you to coordinate strategy with your friends in terms of trading resources and, and building. And Zynga will argue, and most social game developers that will argue that the most powerful thing that exists in this game platform is this bar here that asks you to play and participate with your friends. Um, so that, that community building becomes something that, that has turned Zynga into a billion dollar company just by leveraging this social graph in an interesting way. They've managed to create really compelling gameplay that's driven people back and back and back and back. So over and over again, we see that when games ask people to work together, they do two things. They create like very strong, powerful communities between people that last a very long time and create really fanatic and obsessive behavior. And it increases the intelligence of the group towards the accomplishment of that goal. That if the incentive structure is right, that incentive structure will drive people to become more intelligent collectively and solve problems faster and more powerfully. Um, and this gets leveraged in all sorts of ways outside of games too in, in a field called gamification. Um, the most powerful example of that is Nike Plus. I don't know if there are any runners out here, but like Nike Plus also leverages the, the, the community aspects of games to make things happen, right? So, so like you can take out like, like activity from runners near you. Um, they have combined results where they're asking you to participate in the creation of a large set of miles. You can form small groups with friends or with people online to, to have race challenges against each other or, and I think in the most interesting application, sort of shared race goals that all of you are gonna run a certain amount over a certain amount of time. 
right? So that creates a sense of responsibility, but that creates more activity. And, and um, there are statistics you can find that Nike's published about how much additional running Nike Plus has created um, through the gamification of their site. Um, and, and more and more and more country, companies are interested in, in leveraging the incentives that games provide to motivate behavior. Uh, and, and the game art scene has gotten into this too. This is a game by Chris Bell called Way, um, where two players play on different screens. This is, this is an artificially created screen where you can see both screens. But the players are unable to communicate verbally and they have to like, learn how to communicate using this limited gesture set. So games even artistically are exploring the idea of how to connect people um, by giving them constraints on connection and, and asking them to connect. This game won, um, I was just at a conference called Indicate and this game just won the highest design prize at that, game, at that festival because of its use of communication and connection. Now, the, now the, the poster child for all of this stuff came uh, with the movie AI. Um, and the movie AI sort of laid the way forward to, like, to guess back to fold it. Um, there was an advertising campaign that was built for the movie AI in which players were asked to participate in what's called an alternate reality game. Uh, and the idea behind the alternate reality game is that they set up a series of websites um, on, online. This is, this is one of the actual websites, uh, Martin Swinton Designs. This website's fake. There is no such thing as Martin Swinton Designs. But this little house here and this little sun is a piece of a puzzle um, that, the, that the game designers constructed. And the idea was that this was a marketing campaign for the AI movie where players would get to experience the universe of the movie in advance of the game. Now, this was originally intended to be about a three-month experience. But what happened was, uh, when players coordinated on the thing, they became a, a community called Cloudmakers um, that eventually grew to be thousands of people. And the Cloudmakers would coordinate, this site is still up by the way, you can go here and like, check out all the results of the game. Um, but the, the Cloudmaker players would coordinate to solve puzzles. And so the set of puzzles that the original uh, designers, the 42 Entertainment designers thought were gonna take about three months, the players solved in about two weeks. And so 42 Entertainment then went on to a 60 hour a week cycle of designing new puzzles that would be released on Thursday, of which 80% of them would be solved by the next Thursday. And this became a model for, for collective intelligence and the power of collective intelligence. So th what this game demonstrated is that games can be used not just to create teams, and not just create interesting play patterns be between teams, but to create genuine collective intelligence through an incentive structure that rewards them for solving puzzles, either in a community way or in a systemic way, and then leads them to be more effective than any individual would be in the first place. And, and no one expected this result. And that became the model that was used for these games in the future, including Fold It. So since the invention of this game in particular, we've learned that games have a power for community and collective intelligence that we can tap into if we design the games right. And that power we're just beginning to see. But it speaks to a future of collective intelligence um, and collective participation and community building that I think we're just really beginning to understand even how to tap. So how's this going right now? Well, in 2009, the Pentagon offered a $40,000 prize to help people, uh, to, to, to have people participate in a treasure hunt to see how well people would collaborate online. This was funded by DARPA that's interested in sort of like, basically, effectively, eventually finding terrorists and using this as a technique to find terrorists. And so they asked people to try to find these weather balloons. And they offered a $40,000 prize to get them to the point where they could find the weather balloons. Um, anybody want to guess how the players did? Yeah, they, 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 uh, there were a bunch of different systems that were invented. And some of them had to do with sort of random selection searching. And some of them had to do with sort of communication. Um, but the team that won was a team at MIT. And they won it in less than a day. So what is the power of collective intelligence? We have no idea, right? Because we really only just invented the technology. Um, we really only just provided the, the system and we really only just started thinking from the design heuristic that would allow us uh, to create that kind of experience. Um, but games can create structures that create this kind of emergent behavior and I think the potential for it in advertising and education and politics and in problem solving um, is tremendous and, and, and unpredictable. Um, and I think we're only going to see more things like this in the future. Thanks. <laughs>